alternative, sorry, that alternatives don't lead to alternative decisions, if you know what I mean. So very often a competent authority will say, well, look, you haven't properly assessed alternatives or they'll refuse permission on the basis that the project as proposed may infringe an environmental standard or maybe refuse for reasons which would say that if you'd chosen something else, we would have given you permission. So alternatives still have, I think, a key role in the IA directive in relation to the outcome of the actual decision. Compensatory measures, just um, briefly on that, we know there's no obligation under the IA directive for uh, project developers to take compensatory measures if the project is going to have significant adverse effects on the environment where it's clearly necessary under the Habitats Directive and there's this interesting discussion in the recent Attorney General opinion, Attorney General's opinion about the distinction between compensatory and mitigation measures under the Habitats Directive. One interesting thing she, the, the Attorney General did say is that the directive doesn't exclude in principle the consideration of compensatory measures at the Article 6.3 stage, so she's not actually ruling out that you could also have regard to them before going into the Aropi um, procedure. It'll be interesting to see whether the court picks up and agrees with her on that. The role of the Commission then, we're nearly coming to the end of my, my different comparisons, obviously a more proactive role under the Habitats Directive and in certain instances the project can only go ahead further to a Commission of the Opinion if it, um, sorry, further to a Opinion of the Commission um, under Article 6.4. Access to justice, a bit of a vexed issue, and I don't think it's really been tested here yet. We, under the EIA directive and also under our national implementing legislation, there's clear provision that people, our public, can have access to a review procedure that's timely, fair, and not prohibitively expensive in relation to decisions made under the EIA directive, but there's no equivalent express provision for decisions that are made pursuant to the Habitats directive. But there is a, a court of justice opinion which suggests that the national courts have to interpret national law insofar as possible to give effect to the Our House Directive and, which, to, and to allow people to have access to a review procedure to challenge Habitat's um, revisions. There have been a lot of references to Philip in my slides. This isn't Philip. <laughs> this is a great hamster of Alsace wondering what we're going to do and perhaps how um, these various processes could be integrated as obviously very often they, a project will require both an EIA and an AA and the information gathered in one will be relevant to the other and vice versa. The revised directive is specifically contains provisions in relation to this, so in the case of projects for which the obligation to carry out assessment of the effects on the environment arises simultaneously from the EIA and Habitats Directive, member states must ensure where appropriate, whatever that means, that coordinated and or joint procedures fulfilling the requirements of the legislation are provided for. And under the coordinated procedure, member states are supposed to appoint a designated authority to coordinate the assessments. And in relation to where a joint uh, procedure is proposed, they say there should be a single assessment of the environmental impact of a particular project, which satisfies both the EIA and AA uh, requirements. And the Commission is, going to, is under an obligation to provide guidance in relation to these procedures. I know there's been a lot of issues at national level in relation to integrated assessments under EIA and AA alone. There haven't been any legislative attempts yet to try and deal with the situation, you know, integrating those two, if you know what I mean. There's already been, I suppose, enough to be dealing with in the, with the Commission in Ireland finding. Um, I won't go through uh, some of those provisions, but I've just mentioned there are some sections of the Habitats regulations which deal where, with a situation where there's more, one, more than one competent authority dealing with an AA, and I know if Berna is still here, I think you've been involved in a research project funded by the EPA, isn't that right, in relation to integrated bio biological, <laughs> sorry, which one is it, IBIA, but uh, integrated biological impact, impact assessment, that's the one. <laughs> okay, very good. And I know you, I think you integrated two areas which are going to require integration, the integration of assessments and also the integration of consents and whilst we haven't got any legislative amendments yet to try and bring that about, the EPA has published guidance on streamlining those processes. So whilst it's not um, within the existing framework that we have to ensure that so far as possible um, an efficient and effective assessment of projects under both directives, and I think that's it. And thank you very much nice. for listening. <laughs>
sure there are lots of questions we have time so <laughs> yeah please do Rachel thank you so much and thank you for um, starting in there okay so we have time for questions okay I'd like a lot of different voices if I can but so I'm going to come here and <laughs> sorry about that Michael Hoy um, I'd just like Rachel to clarify there uh, I, I'm just checking my notes there you, di you didn't mention the SEA can we, get another, can we get another microphone to that gentleman because there's a lot of feedback the coming SEA. in on this. Yeah, thank you. You didn't mention no, the SEA. that's right. Unfortunately, I didn't mention the SEA partly for, no. for, for time constraints, but a yeah. lot of these issues will also arise in relation to SEA and AA for the same plan. Actually. Yeah, well, am I correct in saying there's a, 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 an obligation to carry out an SEA for uh, that are impacting on SASCs? Obligation for SEA for developments that are impacted on an SEA. Yes. So the SEA is in relation to plans and programmes, isn't that right? Yeah. So yeah, no, just actually referring to case 177 of 2011. Are you, are you familiar with that one? Um, sometimes I forget the number. I don't know which, you know, the no. numbers. And <laughs> well, I only, no, it, it's uh, obligatory to carry out an SEA. So that would be an umbrella over your... Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, there's other issues there again, and I know in relation to all the integrated assessment yes. papers, they're also looking at trying to yeah. integrate the results of SEA processes as well. Yeah, and then 420 of 2011 is the obligation under Article 3 to uh, establish the uh, economic damage to uh, the uh, communities. Okay. Sorry, is there a question in that? No? No, it's just no, thank you. Uh, that, that's fine. That's fine. Can I get a microphone on the front here? I'm, I'm under pressure because I've been told that we've got to be out of here in four minutes. Okay. So I'm not being trying to cut people off. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, John. Um, uh, Trilling Owen and Professor Rachel, you're with the EPA. I'm so sorry, I can't actually. <laughs> no. Sorry, I, I, were you introduced as EPA? No, 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 no. no. The, a former <laughs> member of the board of the EPA, and no. this is, Rachel is from the Philippine <laughs> Solicitors. Okay, yeah. well, fact, sorry, I just wanted I to ask. Actually, it was more, I used to act for the board. In the oh, EPA. sorry, I'm thank you. I'm not on okay. the board of the EPA. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, I, the, re the question is still relevant. We had the Environmental Liability Directive. Did any requests for action go to the EPA? How is that directive working? Do you know, Owen? Yeah, in practice, I'm afraid. Sorry, I don't know. Okay. I mean, since I was kind of handling okay. the EPA. Secondly, the secondly, the biggest problem we have in the planning system is that we have PhDs in ecology acting for the developer, finding no lesser horseshoe bat or otter or freshwater pearl mussel. At this time, there is no external validation of EIAs. So I'm thrilled when you said there is going to be external uh, independent validation of EIAs. That's why I said good to yes. you just now. Right. I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's going maybe as far as, as you think. It's more just that the, um, the EIA has to be prepared by competent experts. And, that, and then that the decision-making authority needs to have access to expertise to assess those reports. That, there, at the that's, moment, that's yes. That's where we are. I know the, the initial commission proposal, I think, said that the consultants would have to come from some sort of accredited panel. Um, either those that were going to be helping the competent authority of the developers, that's gone. So okay, well, th this is very, very good news because at the moment we're fighting very inappropriate wind farms uh, connected with priority SACs uh, uh, up, up the top of the Lee Valley where the city gets its water from. And Cork County Council have no ecologist. Yeah. The planners have, they've heritage officers, wonderful geographers and geologists but they don't actually have anyone to test the veracity. Because remember, it's the developer is paying for the EIS. Yeah. The developer is paying his PhD in ecology. And I happen to know a PhD who told me he's paid not to find otters, a priority species. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll leave it at that, if that's OK, um, because we're running out of time. Can I ask you to thank each of our speakers for a wonderful presentation this afternoon? Thank you very much. And before, before, Owen, before Owen makes the final um, uh, comment, can I ask you also to make sure you, on your Twitter account, hashtag Environ UCC 2014, keep the conversations going. Thank you very much, Owen. Can I just make one housekeeping announcement? You've got five minutes to get to your coffee and come back. We, we, we have to start here at uh, 6.15 because we have to be out of this room at 5.45. There's another group coming at 6. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you so much for coming. 
Yeah, I know. Enjoy the weather. Have a big old glass of wine. And you'll come to the reception. Great, 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 great. Thank you so much. And the position. Thank you. Thank you for some very good. Thank you. One day. Hold on, I'll talk about this. This gentleman is probably asking for something. Uh, you are uh, just clearing out for people to talk about. Thank you. 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 Hi, how are you? How are you? Um, I have marked his way here. Yeah, I have got a stick if need be, but I'm going to get, um, I think I'm the second one on, so I think I'm going to which, get, which, um, Oh, sorry, hang on. Be handy if I look to the right place. I don't have you there. Have you it on a USB? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. That's lucky. Uh, yeah. yeah I a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, I might have got missed. Second there, no, run yet. And I deal with this man first, and then we'll. Place uh, that in there, and then we'll do the second. Yeah. And F5. Are you on first, uh, Richard? Are you? Sorry, I, no, I'm on second. Okay, and I'll get on you. Yeah, right, well, what I can do is I'm going to ask, because I'm just. I'm going to ask you to load mine on. Yeah, I'll have it loaded. Is that loaded? Of course. I'm, I'm on second. Would you would you load my stuff up? I mean, it's all there, but to do the handover because I'm just terrible at the handover. Oh, are you the same? No, no, don't. Well, just tell me how to just just, just to flick through, okay? Yeah, that's fine. I can no, do that. Just to bring it up, just in case you're wondering. F5. F5. Okay. I want you to come over here. And that's and that one. Yeah. That's easy. And if you want to go back. Yeah, I can do that. And press escape if you want to get over it. Okay. And I'll press it for you down. Yeah, so I've got that bit. I've got that bit. It's yeah. the it's a handover when somebody's just left their old one and then you're trying to look for the new one. I think it's quite nice to have this almost um, like a panel thing at the end. Well, whatever you want. I, I prefer that, that but I'm it's sure something that's that, because oh, no, otherwise you can, you can then interact more and not get. I agree, and there's such strong connections. And otherwise the, other, otherwise the first speaker is just sitting there sort of 
Yeah. Got nothing to do. But I think we just get through the talks, as you say. And yeah, we'll because particularly the timing yeah. is not no, going to be very... No, I think that's... that's is that all right with that's you? That's great. Oh, it's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Um, all right, I'm going to go and get some coffee. That's what I need. You prefer to sit there. I don't mind where I sit, really. <laughs>
down here. Okay. <laughs> down that one. Let's see if this works. Which we can always do is put it on the desktop, copy it over the desktop if necessary. That sounds smart. This is mine. Okay. So, so let's copy it to the desktop. You're up first, Fiona, aren't you? So. Yes. No, just we need to make it a little bit bigger. So we'll just hit F5 when you're... Ah, perfect. Okay. And then to make it go down, we need the arrows or we need the... So if you, to make it down, you can down now. Okay. Okay? Thank you. I can bring it up for you when I'm finished okay. introducing it. Actually, is it possible to um, transfer it onto the desk? Do you think it is? Yeah. Good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome to this final plenary session. Um, I've been instructed to get things underway, so please take your seats. 
um, for, the, for this, the final session on access to environmental justice, innovation and impact. My name is Ursula Kilkelly and I have the privilege of being the Dean of Law here at University College Cork. Um, and it's a particular pleasure for me to be chairing this final session um, of what is a long-standing and hugely both successful and important event in our annual calendar at the Faculty of Law. Um, and before we move on to the speakers, I would just like to pay tribute to all of my colleagues in environmental law, um, all of the support staff who put these events together with such efficiency and professionalism, and particularly to commend Dr. Owen McIntyre for his stellar leadership of this event um, and the area of environmental law over the years at University College Cork. We're incredibly fortunate to have Owen and his colleagues and, and students work in this area and, as I said, provide such leadership and such opportunity for you all to hear from eminent speakers of practice and, and legal um, environments. So it's um, a great pleasure to be here. Um, but enough about the formalities, I suppose. Um, my purpose this evening, chairing this last session, is merely to introduce the speakers to you and to then try and keep them to time so we have time for discussion at the end of the session. We have three speakers for you. They're all going to speak for in around 20 minutes each to keep us to the original schedule. We have Fiona Marshall, we have Richard McCrory, and we have Anya Ryle. Um, I'll introduce each speaker as we go through, but we're going to keep the questions to the end of the session so we can move along through each, each one. So first we have Ms Fiona Marshall, who is Environmental Affairs Officer to the Secretariat of the Aarhus Convention, um, Secretary to the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee in Geneva. She also supports the work under the Convention on Public Participation and promoting the principles of the Convention in international fora, as well as providing legal support to the Secretariat. She's a qualified lawyer from New Zealand. Um, Fiona previously worked as a litigation lawyer in law firms in New Zealand and Ireland, and for several international human rights and environmental non-governmental organisations. So I'll ask Fiona to address you, please. Thank you very much, Ursula, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here with you today. It is really a pleasure to be back in Ireland. I lived in Ireland before I went to work for the Aarhus Convention Secretariat in Geneva, and it's my first time back in 10 years. So I'm very, very glad to be back here in Ireland amongst all the friendly and warm pe Irish people. So today I'm going to be talking about the Aarhus Convention as a tool for integration to promote, promote environmental democracy and justice. We it, recently, Ban Ki-moon described the Aarhus Convention as being more important than ever. This treaty's powerful twin protections for the environment and human rights can help us respond to many challenges facing our world, from climate change and the loss of biodiversity to air and water pollution, and the con Convention's critical focus on involving the public is helping to keep governments accountable. I think that little quote actually identifies well why the Aarhus Convention is such a useful tool for integration, because it is a cross-cutting instrument. It is about procedural rights that touches on environment in all its forms and human rights and good governance. So in itself, in its essence, it is a tool for integration. Now, I am imagining as people working in the environment, environmental sector and many legal practitioners, many of you will already be somewhat familiar with the Aarhus Convention. I would like to start with a small, if you like, introduction for any of those of you who is not already familiar with the Convention. The Aarhus Convention's full name is quite a mouthful. International civil servants know how to make sure that something does not have a punchy name. Its full name is the Convention on Access to Information, Public Participation in Decision Making, and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters. It was adopted in 1998 in the Danish city of Aarhus, Hence, it is known much more comfortably by its, the name of the city where it was adopted, the Aarhus Convention. It entered into force in 2001. It now has st 
strictly 46 parties, although Switzerland has already ratified, so will become the 47th party in June. So let us say that it has 47 parties from the UNECE region, including the EU and all EU member states, and countries from Central and Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. Now, the geographical distribution at the moment is simply because it was negotiated under the auspices of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, where I work. But actually, it is an instrument that is open globally. So there is nothing to stop any other country anywhere else in the world also ratifying the instrument. And actually, parties have strongly encouraged countries in other regions to do so. And I know myself, coming from New Zealand, that I would very much value having a convention like the Aarhus Convention in my own country. Now the people of Ireland do have the convention, because Ireland has been a party to the convention since December 2012. And at the same time, Ireland also ratified the protocol to the convention. It has a very special protocol which deals with pollutant release and transfer registers. I'm not going to go into that today because our time is short, but if you're interested in the area of pollution and emissions, this is a very interesting instrument which Ireland is now also a party to. Now, to provide a quick overview of the convention structure. As its full name suggests, it is based around three concepts, access to information, public participation, and access to justice in environmental matters. In short, regarding access to information, it includes both a passive and a active obligation on public authorities, because all the obligations under the convention are placed, placed on public authorities, that public authorities must both actively, res sorry, they must respond to information requests from the public, and there are strict requirements about how information requests should be responded to, and also public authorities must actively dis collect and disseminate environmental information. So this is in Article 4 and 5 of the Convention, if you want to look more specifically at exactly the obligations that are there. The second pillar is about public participation and decision making. The Convention requires public authorities to ensure early and effective public participation in three types of decisions regarding the environment. Firstly, decisions to permit specific activities. And in the Convention, there is an annex which sets out a, list, a list of activities which are considered that you should be ensured the right to participate. In addition, the Convention also requires public authorities or parties to determine whether other activities may also have a significant effect on the environment. And if they do, then you, the public should also be given the right to participate in those decisions. Secondly, the Convention requires the public to be given the right to participate in decision-making around plans and programs, and to a lesser extent, policies. And finally, the Convention gives the public the right to participate in, the legis in making legislation, in the drafting of laws. And finally, the third pillar of the Convention deals with access to justice. This also has several components. First, it deals with the right for the public to be able to challenge acts or omissions by private persons or public authorities which contravene, contravene national law relating to the environment. Secondly, it gives the public the right to access to review procedures if their requests for information are refused. And thirdly, it gives the public the right to have review procedures to challenge the procedural or substantive legality of any decision that is subject to public participation under the Convention. The Convention sets standards for review procedures, requiring that they must be fair, timely, equitable, not prohibitively expensive, and provide adequate and effective remedies. 
these, in a nutshell, is the three pillars to the Convention. In addition, it has some very interesting general provisions. And in these, this actually shows some of the innovative ways of the Convention. It requires that no one should be penalised or harassed if they have tried to exercise their rights under the Convention. In this sense, it is becoming like a human rights instrument. Similarly, no one should be discriminated on the basis of their citizenship or residency for tr when trying to exercise their rights. This means also that the rights apply across borders. It's not just limited to the citizens of the country. The Convention requires governments to ensure appropriate recognition and support of organisations and groups promoting environmental protection. And it also requires parties, governments, to endeavour to ensure that their officials support members of the public when they're trying to exercise their rights under the Convention. So, in a nutshell, the Convention is, as, is the Convention as a tool for integration can be seen because it has a very wide environmental application, applying to a broad range of environmental sectors, as well as human rights and good governance issues, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And also, it applies at the national and international level. So, if we, knowing not what we know now about the Convention, we have talked about its application in the area of environmental protection, in that it applies across all environmental sectors, including particularly sensitive sectors like the energy sector or water sector. It also is a tool for human rights protection. It helps to ensure good governance helping to hold governments accountable and fighting corruption. And it also is a tool for sustainable development because it requires the public to be involved in plans and policies and programs that may touch upon the environment, which may also be related to economic issues. I also said that it is a tool for integration at the international level. And this one is a special part to me because I have been responsible for this area of work for about nine years now, <laughs> which is that it requires governments to pr promote the principles of the Convention at the international level in any process when dealing with matters relating to the environment. This means that governments who are parties to the Convention, when they take part in the climate change processes or even other processes like, for example, the WTO, when they are dealing with things related to the environment, have to make sure that in those processes they are also pushing for greater transparency and a greater voice for the public in those processes, both at the national and international level. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about how the Convention works to ensure that governments who are parties to the Convention are actually implementing the obligations on the ground. And this is primarily done through two different mechanisms, both of which are open to public participation themselves. Firstly, there is a system of national reporting under the Convention. And this requires that every three years before the meeting of the parties, each government must write a implementation report going through each part of the convention and explaining what they have done to ensure that this obligation is uh, implemented and also informing of any challenges they're experiencing in that. And what is good about this mechanism is that the public must be involved in this process so that the public should also be engaged in identifying issues which are important to highlight in the, the, the report and also being able to comment on the draft report before it's submitted. And the other important tool for promoting implementation under the Convention is the Compliance Committee. 
This is an area that keeps me busy because I'm a secretary to the Compliance Committee. So I can tell you that it is a very interesting and important tool under the Convention, but it's not something to be looked at lightly. It is, it is an com international compliance mechanism. It's not a court or a tribunal. It is not a tool for redress. It's a tool that's designed to help governments to implement the Convention better, but it shouldn't be seen as a remedy mechanism like a court. It was established at the first meeting of the parties in 2002, so it's now been going for more than 12, 12 years. And it, as I said, it is designed as a non-confrontational, non-judicial and consultative mechanism. So not a court, not a tribunal. It has nine committee members who serve in their personal capacity. They are elected at the meeting of the parties and NGOs can also nominate members of the committee. And this is something that is quite special in international law, because in international environmental law, because the members are serving in their individual capacity, not representing governments. So this means it is not a political body as such. Another thing that is very special and unique about the mechanism is that members of the public can bring cases to the Compliance Committee. And this is reflected in its caseload. It has just recently received its 98th case. So, the Compliance Committee can be triggered in a number of ways. In the normal way for international mechanisms, it can be triggered by one government bringing a case against another government. And as an indication of how, what, what, this, what happens if you have a mechanism like this. As I said, we have 98 cases now. So far, only one of those was brought by a government against another government. All the rest were brought by members of the public. So, the, as I said, the mechanism can be tri triggered by one government against another government. A government can also make a case about itself. Not surprisingly, we haven't seen one of those. I have already told you about the public being able to bring cases. And finally, the Aarhus Secretariat can bring cases itself. We have not done so, so far. Now, just to tell you a little bit more about how the, the, the Compliance Committee works. As I have already said, it is not a tribunal. It is designed as a, as a process for consultation with, between governments and those who are bringing the case. So it shouldn't be seen in the litigation sense. It does not have the right to impose sanctions and it does not have the right to impose remedies. It is really about helping the governments to implement the convention better in the future. And on the basis of the cases to date, we can see that it really does help. I thought that it may be interest, interesting for you in Ireland in, in particular. Um, I mean, there are many cases so far and many findings, but two that may be of particular interest to you here uh, is one case that involved the UK and one case that was concerning the EU, but was actually about Ireland. The first case that dealt with the UK looked at the legal system of the UK as a whole, and it in particular looked at the issue of access to justice and the costs for going to court. And the Compliance Committee found that going to court in the UK was prohibitively just expensive and it recommended that the party, the UK, amend its law, amend its cost regime to ensure that the costs for going to court for environmental matters would not be so expensive. And this has had a very interesting development in the UK because they have now introduced new, a new cost regime in their civil procedure rules 
called Aarhus claims, and the claims that come within this category have to be um, given protective cost orders to make sure that the costs will not be so expensive. So we can see that in this case, it has really had a concrete change on the ground. That case may not be over yet, but already we can see that there has been significant progress as a result. And another case that I wanted to tell you about, you may also be familiar with this one because I believe it got quite a lot of media um, coverage, which was a case involving the EU. And the reason that it was brought for, against the EU was because Ireland was not a party at the time. And so this case looked at the renewable energy policy in Ireland and considered whether the EU as also being a party to the convention, had ensured that the public was appropriately involved in the, the making of these renewable energy plans. And in, in that case, it found that the public was not given its full rights under the convention. Now, this is my final slide. <laughs> and I just wanted to let you know that um, we have some interesting upcoming events. In fact, we have the most important upcoming, we have the most important event in our calendar coming up in just a few months. Every three years, all the parties to the convention come together to review everything that has gone under the convention and to set the strategic direction for the next three years. And this meeting is coming up very soon. In fact, it will be held in Maastricht in the Netherlands at the end of June and beginning of July. And in parallel to this conference, there will also be a number of side events. So for any of you who are interested in this area, and also interested to find out more about how the convention works, the, the topical issues under the convention at the moment, and also other actors and stakeholders who are involved in the Aarhus community, you are very welcome to, to take part. I should let you know that all the processes under the convention are completely open to the public. Its processes are as transparent as the convention stands for, and also all its documents are available, publicly available on the website. So if this is something that would be of interest to you, we would very much welcome you in Maastricht at the end of June. So thank you. Thanks very much, Fiona. That was a really important and, and useful overview of the, the Aarhus Convention, particularly focusing on the international pers perspective here in relation to the access to environmental justice. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to hold questions until the end, so I'm going to move on quickly um, to a different context in which uh, access to justice may be, may be played out and delivered, um, particularly our, our nearest neighbour, and, and introduce Richard McCrory, who's a barrister and professor of environmental law at uh, University College London, where he's director of the Centre for Law and the Environment has been a board member of the Environmental Agency in England and Wales and in recent years was commissioned um, to examine possible models for a new environmental tribunal. So Richard, thank you. You did it for me, you didn't need to. Yeah, I know what to do now. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much and thank you very much for the privilege of speaking. I came here I think three years ago and I think this is the highlight of the Irish environmental law calendar, if not the um, for the United Kingdom as well, maybe, but I shouldn't say that. Um, in 2010, uh, an American academic with the unlikely name of Rock Pring did a study of all the environmental courts and tribunals that had been uh, set up around the world. And he estimated there were over two, 350, 41 countries, and interestingly, over half of these have been created since 2004. Now, those of you with sharp eyes, well, notice, first of all, that the uh, United Kingdom is blank, but that Ireland has got an environmental court or tribunal. Now, what he, he, he did was to assume that the Planning Appeals Board is an environmental court or tribunal. There's a shaking of the head. And he has a very generous view of what environmental courts and tribunals. I think probably his analysis, but we might come back to that, is that as I understand it, under Irish law, the Planning Appeals uh, uh, board can refer cases directly to the European Court. They've been designated. In England, the equivalent, the planning inspectorate can't. So I think maybe that's what he picked up on. 
Anyway, um, he has promised me that in the next edition, the United Kingdom will go green, because in that same year, 2010, with actually very little fuss or publicity, um, an environmental tribunal was created in England and Wales. And that kind of lack of fanfare was rather surprising, because we've actually had over 20 years of debate about whether we should need an environmental court or tribunal and what form it should be. So it, it's, it's the end, nearly the end of a very long day. So I thought, I'm just going to tell a story um, uh, about this event. Why should I tell the story? Well, I think, first of all, it does illustrate how significant policy developments can take place. Um, and the first chairman of our Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution had a theory about how do you get big changes in environmental law. And he said you need two things. You need a serious analysis of what needs to be done, so somebody really understands it, but then the politics won't happen. And then you need what he described as an ignition event, some big scandal, waste disposal, whatever, and then the two emerge together. If you have the scandal without the deep analysis, you can get um, some very bad legislation passed. However, one of the problems, particularly in this area, um, is that there aren't really any scandals. We, we have bodies who are making reasonable decisions. Uh, they're not outrageous, I, um, but it could be a lot, of bet lot better. So I have now introduced another theory, which you don't always need an ignition event to get developments. You need what I call an unexpected alignment, where it just so happens there are developments in completely different areas of law or policy which happen to merge. And I've added a third from my own experience of sometimes you just need opportunism. And if you're engaged in this area, I, and anybody in government will know, that occasionally the kind of nexus of where things are taking place, where there's a kind of bubbling of policy, can completely shift to another department or another area of government, the cabinet office or wherever it is. And if you're alive to that and know, well, that's, I should be over there, no longer with the environment, I should be in that area for this moment. Um, that's what I call opportunism. I also, the second thing, and this is particularly aimed at uh, William and other academics from the UK here, and Colin. Um, I don't know what happens in Ireland now, but universities in Britain, every five years we have something called the research assessment exercise, where we are judged for the value of our research, how good it is, and the government funding for the university is critically dependent on that assessment. This year, we're just going through that process, 30% of the marks are given for what's called impact. What's the impact of your research? Quite difficult in something like legal history. But environmental law, if you're doing that, do you have any real impact? So this is again as a study, and I think, I hope, a lesson for academics who feel um, they've got to do this. Now, the standard picture, which I think will be familiar to anybody in Ireland here, very similar, of where does environmental cases, where are they heard in Britain? Crimes in the ordinary criminal courts, civil claims, classical civil claims in the ordinary civil courts, environmental judicial reviews in the administrative court, in our high court. There's a new planning court proposed to be created, uh, really aimed at fast-tracking JRs. We might come back to that. And then what I would call a whole range of what are not judicial reviews, because they are truly merits appeals, challenging and wanting a rehearing of a decision, um, it, which is embedded in our regulatory system. Uh, licenses, remediation notices and so on, and planning, we have a planning inspectorate. We do not have any third party rights of merits appeals. It's always uh, restricted to the applicant for the license or whatever. Um, the stages in the story, well, uh, I look back, um, wasn't like this at the time, but look at the stages, and I think the, there are four key stages. The one which I call detached analysis, but nothing actually happened. And then we were still engaged in analysis, but actually it was more almost like campaigning or very much policy orientated, being more alive to what was needed, but still no politics, nothing happened. And then we get a four-year period, five-year period, where there are these unexpected alignments, tribunal created, and then a degree of what I call um, share opportunism. Um, I should also say, I don't think I'm looking at history. I'm not a kind of Marxist determinist. I think there are individuals who can play a critical part. And you'll see um, one or two names here uh, that crop up all the time. This first period, detached analysis, but no action. 
I think the first mention of the possible need for an environmental tribunal was uh, Robert Carnworth in 1989, mainly talking about the enforcement of planning controls, but he had a paragraph or two saying, I think we should really have a proper tribunal dealing with these sorts of issues. Carnworth then, and this is a name that will crop up, Robert Carnworth then was a barrister, a QC. He then became a High Court judge, Court of Appeal, was in charge of the tribunal system, which is going to be very relevant, and is now on our Supreme Court. So it's a kind of figure that goes through. Um, very significantly, our Lord Chief Justice made a talk, but a little bit, oh, I have to be very careful actually, well, he's not in the room, um, a vision for an environmental court of some sort, but rather incoherent what it was meant to do. It was sort of everything really. It was a rather, but it was a very important the Lord Chief Justice then was making that. And then we get Malcolm Grant, who was commissioned, a planning academic, commissioned by our Department of the Environment to look at models of an environmental court. Now, Malcolm used to be my vice-chancellor. He's no longer, so I can be rude if I want to be. Um, what I would say about his report is that it had all the merits of an academic report in the sense that it was detached, absolutely thorough, conceptually, conceptually quite difficult at parts, but it didn't have a clear message. It didn't have any recommendations as such. And admittedly, the government said, we don't want recommendations, just analyze. So he was a bit stymied. And it was enormously long. Even the executive summary is about 25 pages. So that was the kind of weaknesses from the academic side uh, of that. But what he did come up, really, through all the kind of uh, information and the different models, he thought there were two basic models you're going to have either what he called the Big Bang Theory, where you actually just go ahead, you create a new division of the High Court called the Environmental Court and see what happens. Or you have something much more modest reforms, which you mould a few things there, and then that will gradually develop into um, something bigger. As I said, nothing happened. There was a debate in Parliament, and the government said we don't see any need. And then we move on to a second period where I think there are slightly more, um, still more studies, but a bit more policy orientated, and we begin to get the NGOs involved as well. I was very concerned myself, uh, as an environmental lawyer, at this, the statutory appeals, that thing at the bottom, because I was engaged in them. And it also to be a bit of a model where they went to. Some of them went to, obviously, the planning inspector did the land use ones, a bit like your planning appeals board. Some of the waste one went to the planning inspector, but other ones went to other bodies. And I thought, we should have a look at this. And persuaded DEFRA, uh, our, the ministry, I said, would you, would you fund me for a year to look at these, try and put it together? And they said, fine. Um, I then went to our Ministry of Justice and said, how do I, how do I push your button? Because I know nothing's happened on this. I think there's something, what, what do I do to, to, to get to you? And they said, well, there are just four, civil servants in the room will know that, there are four key questions you have to answer. What's the problem? Can we fix it within the existing system? If we need something new, what is it? And fourthly, what will it cost? Always important which is something academics perhaps sometimes don't do very much. And lastly, they said, absolutely critical, have an executive summary. A minister, or even a permanent secretary, is not going to read more than a page and a half. They, know, they want to know that there's a report behind it. And they then said, you know, Malcolm Grant's report, I'm afraid, you know, it's still sitting there. We've known it, none of us have read it in depth. We haven't got the time. And I took that to heart. And... Um, did a report, uh, looked at over 60 statutory provisions, and found, in fact, as I suspected, the appeal system was a complete muddle where it went to. They went to different bodies, different courts, and so on. And I said, we need a new single tribunal which could pull this all together. Um, there were some challenges in doing this, uh, in that, first of all, setting up then a new tribunal would require new legislation. That's not always easy. I reckoned it would cost, looking at the lands tribunal, about a million pounds a year. I sort of, as one does, juggled figures to say this would still lead to savings, which is just about all right. But there was a challenge. that The existing system, you know, it wasn't broke. It wasn't a scandal. But you had to sort of argue for a vision this would be more coherent. And lastly, very importantly, several people said, well, why is the environment so special? There are other areas, health and safety law. There's um, trading standards, very complicated law. Why do you need something special? 
And I made a case why I thought there were six features of environmental law which made it distinct. It's slightly, you know, I'm a barrister, you're a barrister. You can make up these cases uh, and do it. I'm not sure if I was totally convinced, but it, 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 it went down very well, the report, with the judiciary, with industry, government. So, yeah, this is a reasonable way. And because I should have done it for my background. The one people I hadn't really persuaded were the NGOs, the environmental NGOs. I thought they would see this as a good thing. But they came out with a competing report, also funded by DEFRA at the same time, and they were going for the Big Bang. And they were saying McCrory is just being much too modest and, and, and practicable, and this is rather boring, an environment tribunal. We want an, a new environmental division of the High Court. Um, and one of the reasons, and this is why these competing visions came out, was that their concern was about access to environmental justice. They were looking at the claimant's perspective, saying we need a much more sympathetic court, a cheaper court, and all of that. And admittedly, my regulatory appeals, it was a kind of stalking horse for something, but I just felt this politically would not happen. The result, of course, government, any government faced with competing visions from even the specialist, is minimalist. Nothing happened. And I have to admit, at that point, I thought the story is dead now for another five years. We'll need something, a real scandal uh, to come on board, or an international convention like Aarhus, which forces the pace. And then we get what I call um, my unexpected alignment. Because quite by chance, and nothing to do with the environment, to do with business regulation generally, the Cabinet Office uh, and, and the Treasury had decided to look at business and regulation generally. And one of the things they wanted to look at were the sanctions. What sanctions did regulators have with business? Were they fit for purpose? And I got commissioned to look at that. So it was way outside my comfort zone of environmental law. Um, I think I had 61 national regulators from health and safety, everything. But the, it, it, I came out with some recommendations about um, we rely too much on the criminal law in the UK. We need to use the criminal law for the real bastards, of which there are many. But actually, we could have much more sophisticated and use more civil sanctions for companies who make mistakes, but clearly are not criminal in that sense. And there was a danger we were actually devaluing our criminal law. That's another debate uh, we could have. But a civil sanction system has to have an appeal mechanism. And I didn't want it to go back to the ordinary criminal courts. I said it should go to a new regulatory tribunal. And again, unexpected alignment just so happened at the same time our whole tribunal system was being reformed with a much more robust framework and actually you no longer needed new primary law to set up a new tribunal. You just did it by um, uh, a statutory instrument. It was all much, much easier. So it made sense. The government accepted all the, uh, all the recommendations of my report and the primary legislation was passed for the framework. Now, some people think conspiracy theory, so all I wanted to do was to get an environmental tribunal set up. Now, I, it wasn't the case, because um, I think the case for a regulatory tribunal was there anyway. I have to say, my study for DEFRA before sensitized me more to the whole tribunal system. I didn't, hadn't really come across it properly before, and what it could do, and what its benefits were. So that's why I recommended it. I also didn't uh, force the system on all the regulators. I said, it's up to you to choose, if you want it. And it just so happened it was the Environment Agency who were the first off with the new powers. They got the powers in a limited number of areas, and there had to be a right to a tribunal. So 2010, they internally reorganized the regulatory tribunal and set up the first tier tribunal brackets environment. So that's how it came about, complete chance. And as I've said, you know, one of my bodies I looked at was a body called the... Um, uh, uh, the Potato Marketing Board, which regulates potatoes. If they'd gone off first, I'd be talking to you now about a potato tribunal, uh, which would be not so good. Anyway, the story is not, I'm just watching the time, is not quite complete yet. Um, they set up the tribunal, they put a president who is a um, circuit court judge, very nice, very informal housing, came out of the housing side, six leading qualified judges, ten non-professional members, very important element of tribunal. Um, they were part-time, so they're being paid on a daily basis, very flexible procedures and all, all of that. And then what happened, and I, I'm getting really excited now, I thought this is it. Um, the Environment Agency then turned out they didn't serve um, a penalty notice under their thing, so there were no appeals. Why didn't they serve them? Because there's another system that they can, if they threaten the penalty, 
they can accept what's called an enforcement undertaking, where the, where the industry actually offers them um, a, 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 an agreement. And they find that much more productive. And so we have yet to have an appeal, because we've yet to have a penalty served. Um, there was nearly one a year ago. I got very excited. They were about to throw the first one. And they were rather embarrassed, because it turned out it was to do with packaging. It was against a sex shop with a very unfortunate name, like Furry Delights or something. And they said, oh my god, this is going to be the first test case. But they offered an undertaking and said that. Again, that's another story. So we, nothing happened. So we then move on to what I call opportunism, where their only jurisdiction was to hear these appeals against sanctions. Carnworth was then senior president of the tribunal service and said, asked me, he said, would you re-look at your original thing about statutory appeals you did and see whether there is a case now for getting more of that jurisdiction there. And that's what I did in 2011. I had, to agree, I had a degree of opportunism because the Minister of Justice was sitting there going, ah, oh, yeah, is that good? And I said, look, I'll do it for free. You know, I'm interested in this. My university was right. Once you say something free to a ministry, they say, go ahead and do it. Um, and what I found, actually, was that the position was even more confused in 2000, 2003. Um, there were now 16 different appeals bodies, all with different rules. The planning inspectorate had taken over the waste and the water, but there were lots of other ones like emissions trading, different departments, and so on. Ones where if the Secretary of State was the decision maker on GMOs, there is no statutory right of appeal if he refuses. I'll give you one example, reach chemical regulations. There is one regulation about bodies that can serve notices. And you'll see that if, <laughs> it's just awful this, in one, one paragraph. If the notice is served by the Environment Agency, it went to the Secretary of State, Health and Safety to the Employment Tribunal, Local Authority Management, no, Secretary of State, High Court. So you've got four different bodies interpreting the same rule, different procedures. So the case for consistency was not very difficult to make. And I said, and of course, it was now very easy because I didn't have to make, say, well, why is environment law special? Because there's an environment tribunal sitting there, and that's you know, the case. We're not having to do that anymore. And it's sitting there, so you don't have the problem of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, costs of setting it up. And gradually, over the last uh, two years, more and more of their jurisdiction has been um, expanding. And you'll see the sort of areas that they're dealing with, nitrate vulnerable zones and so on. And the... I thought, and you thought, this was going to be the end of the story. Um, we now, we're away, and it's all going to happen. happen. Uh, it isn't quite over yet, because I've now discovered something called internal cost accounting between ministries, which is the sort of, again, the nightmare. Last autumn, our DEFRA proposed transferring all the water and waste appeals to the new tribunal, which is a really big block, and IPPC, Environmental Permitting, all that. They said that would be a very good idea. They went out to consultation, and most people said, yeah, that's fairly good. A month ago, they rejected it because of the costs. Because what happens is that the Ministry of Justice charges a daily cost to other ministries who want to use their tribunal. And it turns out that their daily cost that they charge is higher than the planning inspectorate's daily cost. So they're competing for this business. I don't think the planning inspector really want it. And actually, I don't think it's apples and pears, because the Ministry of Justice include overheads for the building and everything like that, the planning inspector just charge their inspectors and they get their buildings free from local authorities. So it's a model. So my next task over the next month, I'm trying to unravel all of this internal cost accounting, which shows that I think at this level, if you're trying to change things, you do have to get, unfortunately, into that level of the devil is often in the detail. This is what's determining it, particularly at these times. It's just the way that they charge for costs, different departments. But my, then the, the sort of lessons, I suppose, I get from this is persistence pays off. And I've now decided 10 years it takes. There are a couple of things I've been involved. It's taken me 10 years to actually get the changes. I know, I know Mr. Sweetman's stuff. You, you probably take about 10 years of persistence as well to get that into more. more. Yeah, you know what it is. And lastly, I don't think you can keep a good idea down. I think this is basically a good idea do that. And when we come to questions, I can relate my tribunal to access to justice, which I'll do, but I'm not going to do it now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Um, that, I mean, I, I think we just don't document and reflect sufficiently or, or share our experiences in, in both the successes and the failures of making progress in areas like this. I think it's really, really valuable to hear those kinds of experiences firsthand and we'll all look forward to 
McGrory III. Um, I'm now going to move on to my colleague Anya Ryle. Dr. Anya Ryle is a senior lecturer here at UCC where she teaches tort, environmental and EU law. A qualified barrister with a range of specialisation including uh, in EU, in EIA law and practice, access to justice and the Aarhus Convention. She was appointed to the advisory committee of the EPA in February 2013 and also served as a, a member of the EPA review group which reported to the Minister for the Environment, Community and Local Government in May 2011. And Anya is going to give us some reflections on the Irish context. Uh, good afternoon, or uh, good evening, after a very busy, very long day, I'll be quite brief and to the point, and really just to put out um, reflections, which is obviously the title of my talk. Uh, first, I just want to very briefly acknowledge, in case you're not aware, that it's the Department of the Environment, Community and Local Government that is generously funding this particular plenary session. And I just want to acknowledge that and our particular thanks to Emer Connolly and Marguerite Ryan in the Environment Policy section in the Department. Uh, it, it's great to see the collaboration with the Department and I hope that it long continues. But turning to the business at hand, I'm going to pick up on some points from Fiona and from Richard and to add a few bits and pieces for your consideration. Uh, very quickly, to go back to basics and to focus very sharply on environmental justice, which has come up here and there during the discussion in the course of the, of the day, and to remind ourselves that what we're looking for here, according to the Irish Convention, is effective judicial mechanisms that should be accessible to the public, which of course includes NGOs, no surprise there, and then to ask ourselves why is that so important? And to pick up on themes that are coming out from the European Court of Justice and certainly from the Aarhus Compliance Committee, that the public has a legitimate interest in ensuring that the environment is protected. And that, that is ultimately what environmental law and the courts or other models is seeking to achieve. Many people asked in the course of questions right throughout the day uh, and asked with an edge of frustration, I think, to their voices, you know, what are the consequences when the law is not applied correctly? Because as Bernard Grist put it very carefully and very cogently, uh, bad planning has consequences. It's not a victimless crime. So how are we going to make that real in terms of moving things forward? Which is, of course, the second element of access to justice in this narrow sense, to ensure, of course, that the law is enforced. And to that end, then, we want to quickly remember that the Aarhus Convention, which uh, sets out very clearly in Article 9, that there is a right of access to justice in environmental matters. And delving a little more deeply into that and complicating things somewhat, it's, there is a right of access to a review procedure, again, explicitly to enforce the rights the Convention uh, confers, specifically the right to information, and of course the right to participation, which very many contributors mentioned during the day in many contexts, including strategic environmental assessment, but not just limited to that. And of course, in Article 9.3 of the Convention, as the more expert among you will know, uh, the right to enforce environmental law more generally. So I think it's very important to recall those fundamental basic points, because it's on those that we move forward to build models of access to justice and to assess where we might go into the future. And I'm trying very much in this talk to push us forward into the future. I'm somewhat frustrated myself after 12 years of these conferences what little, and Ted Cook is nodding, what little real progress they, there has been made in, in many areas. And one of the real problems, I think, is this. Uh, whether we like it or not, the main focus, certainly in the Irish debate at the moment, is a very narrow one, predictable to some extent, I suppose, but still um, incredibly narrow, or hang up with the cost of environmental litigation. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting for a minute that costs aren't hugely significant. Of course, they are but it has become more or less the be-all and the end-all of the debate, the very narrow debate that we're having in this jurisdiction. And again, very quickly, most of you in this room will know, we do have special costs rules that apply to certain categories of environmental litigation, the infamous Section 50B, and of course now Part 2 of the 2011 Act. But the problem, of course, is, as most people here will know, there are really serious shortcomings with those costs rules and how they're actually operating in practice. 
Um, unintentionally, obviously, the drafting hasn't proven to be great, and there is a lot of uncertainty as to when these rules actually apply, and that has simply fueled further expensive, slow satellite litigation that serves absolutely no purpose except to attempt to clarify where the costs rules actually apply. It does little more than that. And it's public knowledge, and it was set out in the Programme for Government earlier in the um, year, that further amendments now are seriously proposed to the current cost rules. So before they've even bedded down to any considerable extent, we're already now looking at something new coming down the tracks. Um, so to remind us so that we can engage in forthcoming um, legislative proposals, to remind ourselves briefly about the basic obligation here, and again it's familiar to many of you, but I want to flag some new developments. We are told in the Aarhus Convention and under EU law that costs must not be prohibitively expensive. And for very many years, many of us have been to these conferences and at the November conferences asking ourselves, well, what exactly does that mean? And I suppose there has been some progression on that very complicated issue um, by now, which is the Edwards ruling from Luxembourg and more recently, of course, Commission and the UK from February of this year, where the Court of Justice made some effort to move things forward, but again, in a very general way and left a lot of questions unanswered. So we're not even 100% certain about what the nature of this basic obligation is, and that is, of course, problematic. Making things even more complicated is the fact that the Irish costs rules have proven to be a source of litigation in themselves, as I mentioned a moment ago. And just looking at 2013, we have had an incredible series of rulings on costs, struggling again to interpret what the Irish provisions mean. We've had two Holly Hunter judgments, we've had Kimpton Vale, I won't go into the detail, but just to flag them, and um, I've made the paper available online if people want to follow up. Um, but there's now also the Tesco ruling and most recently Brown and Fingal. Again, individual High Court judges giving their say on what the Irish costs rules mean and giving very little certainty really uh, for developers, for NGOs, for individual litigants and this is a totally unacceptable situation. But we wonder where it's going to lead and I'll, I'll finish on that point in a few minutes. And as well as all of those high court judgments, and just again to go back quickly, the sheer number of them and the time they're taking up and the effort and the cost tells its own story. But we then have a rather cryptic Supreme Court judgment, um, which again came out of a, obviously earlier high court proceedings, where the Supreme Court enigmatically at the very last paragraph of the judgment simply cut and paste paragraph 49 from the Court of Justice ruling in Edwards saying, yes, there's an obligation that costs, of course, mustn't be prohibitively expensive, full stop, and took things no further. And again, that doesn't really help matters in terms of moving things forward. So where are we now? Because as Richard McCrory said, and I agree fully, if we're going to move forward and improve things, we need a really serious assessment of the current position. And in my view, that's something that we really lack in this jurisdiction because there's such limited empirical data about the rate of environmental litigation, who is litigating these cases, the number of cases that don't go ahead at all, perhaps, because of costs reasons. We know surprisingly little about what's going on in the background. But what we have, it seems to me, in Ireland, in the Aarhus context, in the environmental justice context, is a system that is very much in transition, struggling to reach the gold standard of compliance with Aarhus. And we're nowhere near there yet. We have, to be fair, seen very significant changes, certainly, in how we deal with costs, and that's a good thing, uh, but we obviously need certainty and we need something firmer that has a greater bite in terms of how it enables the public and enables NGOs to bring the important public interest type environmental cases. And those changes in legislative terms, the special costs rules, and now the flood of high court decisions on costs related matters, they have all come about as a direct result of Aarhus and EU law. And again, that complicates things in terms of this multi-layered um, legal picture, which means the law isn't ideally accessible to lay persons and so by definition you would need expert and potentially expensive legal advice to even begin to get an action off the ground. 
and the impact of the special costs rules in practice. We've not seen a flood of litigation, and these rules have been in place for a while now. There's no really obvious significant increase, generally speaking, but there has been an increase in the number of lay litigants that are going to court to raise environmental issues and to look for interesting orders relating to costs. But that's a complicated and important story for another day. I simply flag it for now. But in terms of a bottom line and the current position, my own strong view remains that the Irish rules on costs right now are not compatible with ours or indeed with EU law. Um, there are significant shortcomings, not least of which is the fact that the special costs rules have a very narrow focus and there is still so much uncertainty around when they do and do not apply and that is inherently problematic in terms of people needing to know their EU law rights in terms of clearly defined um, uh, positions as regards obligations. And there are still wider points that have been mentioned in the course of the day beyond costs about how Ireland deals with its international and EU law obligations. And this is where I want to flag the big issues beyond costs that sometimes get pushed to one side because of the intense focus on the costs issue. Very quickly, most people in this room will know there are serious problems with the Commissioner for Environmental Information in terms of the appeal fee, the lengthy and unacceptable delays in having appeals determined, largely due to ongoing resource constraints in that office. The standard of review, in other words, the extent to which judges are prepared to get involved in the more substantive type issues around environmental protection remains problematic. The legacy of the O'Keefe judgments where the judges defer or take a hands-off approach to the more um, classic planning and environmental issues. And again, that's a big issue that we won't deal with today, but it's important to flag it. Um, another bugbear of mine, and it links in with costs, is the difficulty involved for anyone in trying to get access to written accounts of costs rulings out of the High Court. So you can even track what's happening. Like justice should be administered in public, these rulings should be available quickly, sometimes extemporary rulings, they aren't available to the public at all, there's no knowledge that a certain ruling was made, and, and that is obviously not compatible with Aarhus, and it's fundamentally wrong. Um, and finally, of course, long delays in terms of accessing justice. Again, conflicts with the Aarhus obligation of timely, timely access to the courts or to the commissioner or whatever it might be. So that's a fairly grim picture, and it's been that way for quite some time now. And what I want to talk about is how we move forward. And the current position is, and I've said this a few times, but I think it bears repeating because it resonates with many issues and frustrations that have come up in the course of the day, whether it's in relation to planning and Kieran Commons's very astute and careful analysis of a myriad of problems with planning law. Um, but it's our reactive and piecemeal response. There's no big plan, no big picture. We move forward in a very ad hoc way, and that inevitably leads to deficient legislation, which inevitably leads to more litigation. And we have to start moving away from that particular approach. Something more strategic, more collaborative, and looking ahead is what's needed. There have been so many missed opportunities on the back of what the Aarhus Convention demands, that it's a shame that so many years have gone by now without Ireland stepping up um, and dealing and engaging with Aarhus obligations in a collaborative and forward-looking way. I think there are important lessons that we can learn from the UK, and it's wonderful that we have Richard here with us. So we can ask the question, well, how do we engage with Aarhus and integrate Aarhus and EU law into our legal system successfully? And one potential way of doing this, I think, is the model that was deployed in the so-called Sullivan Report, which Richard McCroy played an enormous role in, where a group of independent experts got together in the UK context, looked at what the problems were, not just around costs, but on access to justice more generally, identified these issues and considered practical solutions. And I think that model of the independent expert working group that could, in theory, report reasonably quickly is a potential way of moving forward. And that particular group was chaired by a judge, which I think added an important edge to it. And if there was one thing I wanted to get across today, it's that we really should consider looking at that model 
of moving forward. There's huge unfinished business here connected to all of that. Um, the report of the EPA re Review Group, which came out in 2011, recommended a wider review of environmental governance in Ireland, not just tinkering with costs or think tinkering with this and that in the ad hoc way that I mentioned. But we, we need to construct and argue for a future agenda, look at the bigger picture, and get involved in more joined up thinking to try to mainstream Aarhus obligations and not just deal with them on the hoof as crises come up or the Commission starts infringement proceedings or the Aarhus Compliance Committee starts looking at difficult issues. So to conclude then, we need to explore these new approaches and I think part of that involves um, an issue that came up a few times this morning and certainly in the context of the planning regulator that Tom Flynn spoke so well about and its potential education and enforcement role, we absolutely have to improve the quality of decision making at first instance to try to reduce the need for judicial review to promote faith in the system. And part of that involves very much dealing with issues that came up in other contributions today. Uh, Ted Cook mentioned there not being qualified ecologists in certain local authorities. Kieran Commons mentioned the lack of hydrologists. There is no excuse for this and the resources have to be found. People need to have effective complaint mechanisms. Again, the Ombudsman was mentioned this morning, but there are resource constraints there too. We need to resource public authorities to enforce the law. That's an old bugbear. It hasn't gone away. And that all leads into the point I just made. If we sorted out these issues, we could reduce the need for judicial review, and that would be a good thing, because a lot of judicial reviews are brought because people do not have faith in the system. Bad decisions are taken, and people are looking for those decisions to have some consequences in terms of sanctions or in terms of some sort of legal recourse. So we need fresh thinking. And the simple question I will leave you with is this. What is our vision for the future of environmental justice in Ireland? What is our vision? Because it seems to me that we simply do not have one, and we need one fairly urgently. And I would hope that the UK experience, for better or for worse, might give us something to work with there. And simply doing that analysis, I mentioned the working group model, coming up with a coherent strategy, and then getting on with that job and getting on with it fairly promptly before things get any worse. And I'll just finish by saying, as Bernard Griss said, um, there are consequences to bad planning decisions. It's not a victimless crime, and I'm paraphrasing that very badly, but that, that is essentially the point I want to make. So thank you very much for your close attention. I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Anya. That was um, a, not just a, a, an insightful but a very critical analysis of the current state of, of uh, access to justice and environmental issues in Ireland currently, but also questions very much for the future. Um, everybody has kept remarkably well to time. Thank you for that. So we have about uh, 13 or so minutes for questions for those who'd like to, to address them to either Anya, Fiona or Richard. Um, I presume there are mics ready at the back, so if you'd like to raise your hand and we can possibly take two or three questions before we move to the panel. Okay, thank you. Can the lucky one. Hello, uh, Michael Hoy. Um, I'd like to ask about um, the um, duty there uh, in the seventh, the duty of every person on the seventh recital there of the Aarhus Convention. What would, it's the duty of every person and would anybody like to elaborate on the every person? Well, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> yes. I wouldn't even dare to. Well, I mean, just very quickly, I mean, the recitals aren't legally binding, but of course they help us interpret the more substantive provisions of the Convention. But it's a simple point. It's a common sense point. We all of us have a duty to, to fight for a better quality environment, no matter who we are whether we're individual citizens, whether we're judges, whether we're local authority officials. And that, that's a simple point that I think it's important to state it in the Convention, but no more than that. If you have something specific in mind or a specific question. Well, I do. It's actually linked to my point about EIA review. And uh, how do you uh, uh, activate this duty? If we have a duty, uh, how do we get access to court? 
access to, to uh, a review mechanism. Well, just very briefly again, and, and not meaning to sound, you know, well, we have a constitutional right of access to the courts. We have a right under EU law to not prohibitively expensive access to the courts in environmental matters. But the difficulty is in practical terms how that works. But we've already seen many lay litigants going in themselves and being heard by the High Court. So there is access to the courts. Agreed. Correct. I'm not, I'm not arguing with you. I mean, there's board oh, plenary as well. Yeah, but, you know, that, that's not a question. Yeah, but well, I'll just Good. get back mm. to the point about the, the duty. Everybody has a duty. The decision maker, the legal profession, we all have more courses in the better That's my point. Thank Can you. I just, I, I, yeah. well, I'm not going to get in, into the law, but I, I do have a concern. This, this gets back to your vision and the vision of Aarhus, mm. is that... And, and my barrister friends don't like me saying this, but I do think that in the United Kingdom and Ireland, our judicial review procedures, which we've developed, which are not dissimilar, mm -hmm. it's a very gold-plated sort of approach to judicial review. As you know, it's very formal, it's very costly, even with the cost capping. Mm -hmm. You know, when I talk to my Dutch colleagues, or even French colleagues, and say, well, what happens? And they say, oh, well, you just pay five euros and it goes to a local tribunal. You know, there are no legal costs involved. Now, it may be not quite as perfect and as thorough as a high court judge dealing with it, but it does worry me that however much we tinker with the costs and some of the procedures, that is not actually the vision of Aarhus, which is, which may be reflected by, is to allow everybody some sort of access to a quick and easy review procedure, which ideally should be quite informal. And I'm just not sure, this is why, I mean, what, what I've just, but I knew it would go down like a dead balloon. Is that right? Dead weight. Um, which is why, you know, this environment tribunal I see as a kind of stalking horse in the, the government's proposals about judicial review, who are very worried that it's being misused and all that sort of thing. I said, well, why don't we have, we won't have third party rights of appeal in the UK, but why don't we allow people to third parties, particularly if they participated in the regulatory procedure, to appeal to the first tier tribunal on grounds of substantial or procedural illegality. Words of so it's not a judicial review, it's actually a kind of limited merits appeal. The advantage of the tribunal, I think, over the planning appeals um, commission is that the tribunal can and is confident to rule on law mm -hmm. because it has a legal chair and it has expert members. It's, all the procedural rules say they are to help people they are to engage in informal resolution. There are sorts of things which we're still in formal litigation, we're not sure. So I still think we've got a long way to go, that, that yeah. vision of Aarhus. I know there are some other countries who also have very formal, but I think we are particularly formal. The problem is, and this is the challenge to the NGOs, you mentioned the Sullivan. We raised this in Sullivan, and Carnworth said, our tribunal system, in fact, the after can handle judicial reviews. We could start again with a clean slate. What would you like if we started again? We could have, as in the European Court, we could have a limited period for oral presentations, which I have seen, I think it can work quite well. Mm. We could have no cost rules. We could do anything we like. And I have to say that the national NGOs, of which I have been advisors, didn't want it, because they actually enjoyed and welcomed their day in the High Court, however expensive, because it's a very formal thing, particularly if you win. But I'm not sure if that's what Aarhus is really about. It's about a lot more ordinary people Very who can much. challenge yeah. things. And that's my, I, I think that's a real worry that we've got, not just in Ireland, but I think the UK. I don't know if that makes Thank sense you. to okay. I'm you. I'm Sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go back to the floor. So you might yeah, just go back okay. to the floor. Thank Sorry, you. I'll stop. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to add that when we're talking about getting ideas, actually, I didn't have time today to go into the structure of the convention and the bodies under the convention, but there is three task forces under the convention, and each of those are in the way, if you like, think tanks about each pillar of the convention. 
So there's a task force on access to information, there's a task force on public participation, which I have serviced, and there's a task force on access to justice. And it's exactly in this forum where governments and NGOs and academics come together and discuss and exchange what they have experienced in their country, what has worked well, what challenges they face. And so if you are interested in this idea, and interested in exploring further about the experiences that other countries that have already been parties to Aarhus for many years, how they have dealt with these issues, then, as I said before, all these meetings are open to everybody, so you would be welcome to register and to go along and hear what they say, and also, of course, to share your own experiences. Okay, thank you. So a couple of questions here and on either side. Thanks. Mike, just keep your hand up to the mic. You can come to it. Thanks. Um, first of all, um, Thanks uh, to all the speakers for a very stimulating um, session at this end of the day and compliments to UCC for an excellent conference as always. Uh, sorry, I should introduce myself, attractive Rin von Tashka. Um, and I, I would just say we weren't so much spoiled for choice with the parallel se sessions as tortured by the choice. Um, um, but this day, as with many of these conferences, has highlighted the, the fundamental importance of European law in guiding Ireland's approach to environmental protection and our standards in that whole area. And without question, I would like to acknowledge the importance and the role that the EU has played in raising the whole standards of environmental protection in Ireland, and in particular the role that the Commission has played in that, uh, both in the interests of pu public health and the environment. But I think it was, it was in the context of the JC Savage case that Justin Charlton um, made the statement that in interpreting the scope of 50B, that he thought it unlikely that Ireland would go any further than the EU. And I suppose it's in that context um, and in the discussions that we've had about the Aarhus Convention, the fundamental non-compliance of the EU itself with the Aarhus Con Convention has to, has to be addressed. And um, notwithstanding the fact that there's possibly uh, very poor prospects of an access to justice directive um, being moved within the EU at present. There are also other issues with access to information within the EU um, institutions itself. So it would seem a, a fairly fundamental um, flaw in the whole structure and hierarchy within the whole member state constituency um, of the EU that the EU itself is non-compliant. And I suppose it brings me back to one of the, the points in Fiona's slides about the role of the Secretariat in actually taking actions against parties and the EU being a party and I just was wondering could you expand on what are the criteria for the Secretariat actually taking action um, just and particularly in the context of what I've outlined about the EU. Yes. Okay thank you. Sorry if we're just going to I'm just going to there's one other question because it may be the final opportunity. Is there anybody else you'd like to ask one at the front and that would probably be it. So we'll take those before we go back and the panel will have the final say. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Karin Dubsky of Coastwatch. I have a question which is a hybrid between public participation and access to justice. Um, I'm looking for a mechanism where members of the public could <coughs> propose marine protected areas or indeed propose management plans and not just propose but be heard. So at the moment, if I plan to use, like I'm looking for an aquaculture license, then there is a mechanism. If I want to protect, there isn't. If the panel had any views, how to get further. Thank you. And finally. Just a quick one. Yep. Firstly, I, I enjoyed my trip to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was absolutely, take, take the mic, yeah, I was absolutely amazed at the quality of the judiciary. Every single one of them knew the case backwards. And compared to some of the judges I've appeared in front of here, that was very welcome. I really did enjoy it. And I particularly enjoyed the questions from Advocate General Sharpson, because she and I are absolutely at one. Now, I have one question. I've actually asked this question before, yeah, I think here. Under the 2011 Miscellaneous Provisions Act, we have a section in it which says, judicial notice shall be taken of the Air House Convention. Has anyone yet worked out what that means? Yeah, so we've, we're very precise questions. We might have precise answers and the knowledge that people will have time to engage socially later, very soon actually. So 
Whoever no, wants to take those questions. Well, that well just one. very quickly on the judicial notice point, I mean, my own understanding is that it simply means you don't have to prove to the court that there is an Aarhus Convention, a, and it, it's just they take notice. It's as simple as that. It, well, it depends what you want it to mean, but there is the broader issue that the Aarhus Convention is supposed to be taken into account, just like EU law in interpreting national law, but the judicial notice thing... But it doesn't say they should enthusiastically no. support it, yeah. necessarily, I mean, in that sense. That is not what it means, yeah. you're, you're right, it's a very neutral... And the, the, there was very specific questions on the Secretariat action and yeah. also on the public proposals. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to come back to your question. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, as, I, as you may have seen from this slide, there was the four ways for the compliance mechanism to be triggered. Any one of those is equal. So just as any member of the public can trigger, any party can trigger, and the secretariat could trigger. But that once it's triggered, the case is just the same. So there would be absolutely no advantage for the secretariat to bring the case when any member of the public could also bring that case. And the Secretariat actually sees that it is more important to act as a neutral role, given that there is this possibility for any member of the public and any party to trigger to actually serve all our stakeholders than to be seen attacking, if you like, one party. So because there, there is you know, all members of all parties to the Aarhus Convention and all members of the public can bring a case themselves. The Secretariat hasn't seen the need to itself to stand away from its neutral role to take a case like that. Okay. And the final question? Um, well, just, just very briefly, uh, Karen's very excellent question about um, how people might be able to propose marine protected areas and propose management plans in that context. I mean, the best I could say at this stage is, as you know, there's legislation being prepared at the moment in terms of foreshore, marine, etc. So now would be as good a time as any to pursue that with the Department of the Environment. And there are people here much better qualified than I on the marine side of things, but if it was something that could get traction, because it sounds so sensible and in everybody's interest, um, but I think it's more lobbying as what needs to be done to try to see could you get something into the, the upcoming legislation. At that point, that's a very, very brief point because we, ha we unfortunately have to close. Uh, SI 477 of 2012 is being suggested by the gentleman here. You might meet up at the book launch to talk some more <laughs> about 477 of 2012. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, can I ask you finally, please, to just thank Fiona, Richard, and Anya for their excellent presentations and their engagement, <laughs> and, and to you all for staying with the, uh, the conference until the bitter end. I have um, Owen McIntyre, who's going to close the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Um, I've been rushing and hurrying and hurrying people all day, so I promise I'll take less than a minute. We have to anyway, we really have to be out of this room, somebody else is using it in about 10 minutes. Um, a couple of, of housekeeping announcements. First of all, for those who require uh, CPD certificates, uh, these will be sent out next week. Um, to invite you all to the book launch of our colleague Benedict Sage's uh, book on uh, the precautionary principle in marine environmental law, uh, and of, uh, our drinks reception is in the, um, the senior common room which is in the uh, nor what's that? north wing, the central wing of the, uh, of the quad. So please come along there now immediately. Um, and we can continue the discussion and the, the questions and everything over a glass of wine. Uh, there are feedback forms on the desk where you registered. So anybody who has, and please do give us your comments because we really do try to, to, to pay heed to them. So uh, please fill out the feedback form. Take one with you and send it back if that's easier. But please do take those along and, and, uh, and pass them out. And the other thing is that the presentations, and there are a number of full text papers as well, they'll be on the web in the next couple of days and available. Uh, we haven't produced, we haven't copied everything this year. We've received generous sponsorship from the EPA and their policy is that we shouldn't uh, print everything and waste paper in that way. So um, uh, it's, all, it's, it's a terrible headache anyway, to be perfectly honest. Uh, 
photocopiers die on you at the last minute and things like that. So we haven't, but they will be on the web in the next couple of days. And if I could just finish out by thanking a number of people very, very briefly. Um, obviously, I want to thank our speakers and chairs. Uh, the speakers, I'm always bowled over by the, the time and the effort that people give to come and do this every year. And again, people still vo continue to volunteer their time. And for our chairs who have the terribly difficult job of trying to keep people to time, having to, having to cut dead conversations, having to refuse more questions from the floor, so very, very, very grateful. And I, I want to make a very special uh, mention in relation to that to our sponsors. We've had a very, very big uh, field of speakers, you know, many people who have flown in and come a, a good distance. We can't do that without sponsorship. It's just not viable. And so if I could just mention the Environmental Protection Agency for their, for their uh, generous sponsorship, the Department of Environment, Community and Local Government, the Department of the Taoiseach and the Communicating Europe programme for our second session this morning, focusing on EU law, and of course Roman Dilly German, who have sponsored us from the very, very beginning, very generously, without hesitation, and who are kind enough to buy us a drink this evening uh, so that our conversation can run on. Um, and those two things are very closely connected, the, the range of speakers that we can put on and the fact that we do get this generous sponsorship. And of course, and I don't, not, not by any means last and absolutely not least, um, our support staff, particularly Noreen uh, and Pat, our, our uh, tech guru, and uh, our student help, and obviously all of my colleagues, but particularly um, Anya Ryle, but also, of course, Benedict, Irene, and all my other colleagues uh, for all their, their a huge amount of work that they contribute towards this event. Thank you all very, very much. And sorry, the participants. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for um, sharing. I've known worked out there's a new role for chairs, which is to, you've got the slides up for each of us. Yeah, she was Just like that, so quick. No, 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 I'm going to make sure in future, all chair, because it's horrible when you're speaking, because you're trying to get your notes together, your thoughts, and then the bloody thing doesn't work, and then everyone is watching you, and you're fiddling. It was wonderful, no, it's really nice, thank you so much. No, um, I'm going to keep you updated about the bridge, because it's... Oh, God, yeah. It's just nice to have them afterwards. You can send them on to you, Richard, for your website. It's good. Sorry? Oh, yes. Oh, God, no. I'm going to do too. And actually, I'm afraid that our national engineer We've got we've got we've got we've got a kids week. No, no, no. We want to carry on in the High Court. No, you should come in the this is what we have to do to get past into a shirt and tie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. <laughs> Great, Pat, thank you so much.
Pat, do you want to log off or? Uh, no, I'll leave you on, sorry. Okay, no problem. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Oh, anything else? I'm here to help anyway, so. Just know this is a class, no idea what anything does. It's a mystery to me. Um, is that your stick pad or is it someone else's? Someone else's. Will I just grab it? Yeah. Can I grab anything for you there? No, it's okay, no. Should we take the UCC one up to the picture? John did, you know. Because John knew about it. Yeah, he didn't take the bag. Oh, this is the bag. And what would you be on the table? Is there one? There is one. Straight away, or where are we going? Well, I'd say we're starting pretty much